Uh, big round of applause for Eric, please. Hi guys, pleasure to see you. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk today to you about uh, Hashcore Vault, which is a really nice tool. Uh, I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to explain a little bit about what my Bluestress employer is doing. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, why Vault is uh, great uh, and how you can use Vault in a, in, a, in a workflow that makes you get up to speed really, really quickly. So, who of you guys has used Vault already? So why not? Well, it's out there for months already. <laughs> you can't use it. But you were busy, right? Yeah, we're busy. So that's the thing. So I'm going to help you uh, use Vault in 120 seconds, so you can kind of start tomorrow. Okay? Good. So uh, what Neuralize is doing, uh, who of you has ever heard of Neuralize? Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So uh, we are building a radically different cloud, one house at a time. So we put Xeon servers in houses and we heat your home. Then we connect them with glass, glass fiber and we're building a radically different infrastructure. Uh, why are we doing this? Because uh, running a cloud is uh, very expensive. There's a lot of costs in the data center, that's the red area. The cost of cooling, excuse me, is blue. The cost of servers is orange. Um, and the cost of server power is green. Now uh, we have uh, some uh, really lead, market leading uh, cooling technology. So Intel is watching us, uh, Google is watching us. Um, and um, we are actually uh, reducing the cost of the data center by not having a data center, just having to build a heater. Uh, and uh, we are so efficient with cooling. We have a uh, power usage effectiveness, that's a sort of data center term of uh, 3%, uh, 1.03 that is, while the market leaders have 1.02. So um, uh, we're, we're doing really good here and uh, we say let the price wars begin because we have a lower uh, cost of uh, operating. So uh, Google, Amazon start to fight. They say it started already but it's nowhere yet and we're happy to uh, be participating in that because eventually we think we can uh, operate this at a lower cost by not having a data center. Right? Um, so that's pretty awesome uh, but that's not what you came for. You came for uh, seeing these uh, beautiful people, it's uh, Jan and Rieske, and uh, they have uh, one of the prototypes, and in 2016 we're going we're gonna to scale out. So that's pretty exciting, and we have nice work to do, but we also have to do it uh, professionally, so we're going to use uh, Vault for that. You have a question already? Well, if it's summer and it's 35 degrees outside, does it shut down the server? No, 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 <laughs> because the, the, the server is really expensive, so you can buy uh, for 70 euros, you go to Gamma and you buy for 70 euros, you buy a heater, electrical <laughs> heater, one kilowatt hour, hour, right? <laughs> and if you have one kilowatt hour of Xeon CPUs, it's super expensive, so you cannot afford to uh, turn them off. So we have uh, advanced cooling technology where we can uh, reuse the heat for your shower system, we're building that now, or you can dump it outside if you really uh, don't need the heat because you're on a holiday. But we can do compute, so we do scientific computing, protein folding, wave simulations, all kinds of things. But uh, I, would, I would love actually to give a talk on this alone, because there is very interesting stuff going on in the compute market, and in the data center market, and in the energy market, and it's, it's amazing, we're being bold, but I, you know, I want to tell you about Vault right now. So I can answer questions afterwards, or maybe have a separate uh, talk about uh, the strategy, because it's, I think it's pretty interesting. Maybe you think so too, then can I go to Mark, right? Because otherwise uh, I'm uh, just selling myself and I'm here also to talk about uh, Paul. But I appreciate it. <laughs> I, do, I do appreciate the enthusiasm, so I would love to talk about it more, right? So, Vault. Now, you have not been using Vault, but it's out there uh, uh, for uh, for a few months, so uh, it's not too late, but uh, let's start tomorrow, uh, because I make you uh, start in 120 seconds, right? So, step baby steps, but then become really professional with exit control lists and stuff, right? Like the, like the, 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 the real world. big guys do it. So, uh, secret management, you have uh, various uh, approaches. You have Keypass X and it's a tool to install it on your desktop and you have a file and it's encrypted and you can put the file on Google, Google Drive and you can share the drive and then there's a log file and you can do it like that, right? It's one approach. There's no API but it works. Then you have black box and you can uh, commit your GPG encrypted uh, secrets to, um, uh, to Git which is uh, nice but then you start using a GPG and then your secrets are in Git and it's sort of awkward, right? Especially if you commit the secrets to, to different projects then uh, it's kind of uh, funky, I, I think. 
then you have Ansible Vault, it's sort of different purpose, but it's basically file encryption uh, with a uh, shared secret. And then you have HashCorp Vault, and it's, uh, I think it's a uh, build of uh, gold and, uh, and awesome and win. Uh, but uh, we can make it slightly uh, easier, so uh, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, HashCorp Vault, huh? so uh, these people uh, do uh, cool stuff, and they uh, solve development problems and operations problems. So uh, they decided, uh, let's make a encrypted uh, key value store, so you can query it with a REST interface. Clever guys. Uh, and um, there's all kinds of enterprise features, because uh, HashiCorp is kind enough to make it open source, but they also want to make a lot of money. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, they succeed, right? So they have authentication backends, so you can... Uh, uh, you have storage or uh, you have storage backends and access control policy so that you can define who can access what secrets and then you can define sort of uh, uh, yeah I have access to a whole tree of secrets or to all the prod secrets but uh, some other guy only has access to a few uh, prod secrets or only to uh, secrets for your uh, staging environment uh, and, and there's high availability with console uh, they cleverly combine that uh, because they use uh, sophisticated uh, tools and they have audit trails for the bank so uh, you could see the secret that you actually did, right? So uh, explain why the server is now down. So you have uh, all this uh, accountability stuff that uh, enterprises want, so that's awesome. But wait, I just want to share some secrets, right? So if you are a developer who wants to uh, maximize the parity between uh, dev and uh, pod, uh, then you're gonna, uh, you just want to make sure that everything you test, uh, that it works like that in Bolt. And if you are uh, programming against RESTful API and you assume some secret to be there, then you want to test in depth whether that secret is there. And then you pray that once you go to Bolt, that that secret is also in Bolt then, right? In production. So that's one thing. You also want to be able to quickly reorganize your secrets, so you say, okay, I'm going to build a new tool, I need new keys, I need new uh, uh, RSA keys, or a shared secret, or whatever. Uh, so you want to be able to quickly reorganize this and test your applications, whether they appropriately query the right paths uh, in, the, in the key value store. And you want to treat these changes in your code that query new paths in your key value store, you want to treat them as dependencies. So you've got to test this as code. You've got to propagate that from, from dev to, to staging to production, right? And you want to help your dev friends by running your development software. So you didn't only commit your new code to your brand, <coughs> but you also committed the definition of your secrets. So you can, you want to actually specify in the code that what secrets you depend on. And you want to help your ops guys uh, before you go to production to make sure that the secret that your, your, your application that runs and queries at runtime in production, it queries your, your key value store with secrets, it queries your fault, and you want to make sure that those secrets are there. So you've got to tell your ops people, generate secrets, this is the key, I don't care what the secret is, as long as it's not longer than 30, 32 characters, because then my SQL <coughs> replication goes preserved, I discovered that, it sucks. But uh, anyway, so, so you can even test with a certain length of secret, right, because you tested that in depth. So that's what you're going to do in plot as well. So you prevent all kinds of problems. Um, okay, so this is the use case, right? But now, how do we actually use Vault? I give a CLI example. You're in Vault, right, some secret path. And the secret contains only one key in this case. It's called password. And it's a short password, right? Now that, that's it, and then you can uh, read it, and uh, oh, I cheated here, because actually you have to put read minus format is JSON, and then you get the JSON format, otherwise you get some table format. But this is basically it. So it's super simple, right? And you can also query a REST formula mm -hmm. API, and you guys know how to do that. So you can either use this for uh, storing your secrets in production, in a key value store. And at runtime, your applications can query this vault. And the applications know their secrets. And you have a dependency on being able to reach the, the vault and that sort of stuff. That's one possibility. Or the other possibility is, yeah, you run this and it's not really like critical, but as soon as you want to deploy something to production, you start Terraform, apply, etc. And Terraform queries 
some vault and if you succeed then it turns out you have permissions to create infrastructure at AWS for example. Right? Uh, or same sort of scenario, not at runtime, but you, you deploy stuff, you need secrets, for example Ansible, and you configure a remote host uh, to store on disk the secrets that it needs to do uh, its work, database uh, secrets, etc. So that's the use. Uh, that, that's uh, the users. Now, workflow one. Oh, actually, I should have shown you this. So workflow one is uh, your production applications you thought at runtime, and they query the the vault API, and you want to test these propagation of your uh, new dependencies uh, in uh, in uh, staging. Um, and uh, the suggested approach, so this is a workflow that I suggest. You put your dummy secrets uh, that your application depend on as unencrypted YAML files in the relevant Git repository uh, that you're actually writing code for. So the dependencies, which is the secret path, yeah, slash uh, bolt, slash my secret, slash uh, my SQL, uh, is in the Git repository. And it's like a dummy password, so you can actually run your code with that dummy password. Uh, and if you go to production, you just see the diff and you see, hey, new secrets appeared in the YAML file, so I have to maybe manually put them in the, in the actual environment, right? So it's not good. Everything is automated, but it's, uh, it's a nicer way uh, uh, and a more solid way to keep uh, account uh, of what you're doing. And workflow 2, that's uh, another uh, use case, you can also combine them, um, is at uh, at deployment time you only use vault, so that's Ansible and Terraform and the suggested uh, approach is uh, encrypt your secrets for example uh, Ansible vault which is a way of doing shared secret encryptions of files push them to a central git re uh, repository I, this is a choice right, I would suggest you put all your secrets in a central repository and then give passwords to the relevant people because I don't want to put Maybe, maybe your project is open source, you can even put your dummy secrets in the YAML file in the open source project. But even if it's encrypted, you wouldn't want to you know, put the file on public GitHub. Uh, or you push it to some other database, but anyway, you share the encrypted <laughs> file and be careful with the shared uh, secret that you can use to unencrypt the file. Right? Uh, so this is another way. And workflow 3 is you go full multi, we're now, uh, suddenly we're a bank. And uh, we have a lower trust environment, so uh, we have to uh, uh, give only uh, on the need to no basis stuff, you need ACLs, leases, audit blocks, etc. Uh, and you want to keep your production secrets uh, in a hosted, highly available vault with all the trails and all the fanciness. But you want to go step by step, that's first of all, right? Especially if you're uh, not a bank but a startup, like us. You start uh, playing and you don't uh, first do a uh, uh, project initiation document from your uh, enterprise architect uh, to uh, <laughs> now you do a vault with highly available secrets and that sort of stuff. Huh? So. Uh, we're a startup, we want to do it uh, professionally, but we start step by step. Uh, and eventually, if we're super professional, uh, you want to keep uh, the flexibility that your desk can uh, start playing with secrets and, and you're not really touching the, the, the big uh, production vault and still work and still go to production eventually. Um, so the approach is use workflow uh, one and two, combine them, use uh, Neuralize Safe, which is a small uh, utility that I publish uh, today. Uh, and uh, maybe it makes your life uh, easier. And it's uh, designed to be a non-intrusive uh, tool, uh, so you can throw it out as soon as you actually uh, know how to use uh, Vault in, a, uh, in the vanilla way. Uh, and another goal of Neuralize Safe is to be obsolete uh, by the next release, uh, because uh, only the workflows remain if you uh, implement this upstream, uh, for example. Uh, if, if, if we think it's useful, eh? so let's uh, look at what we uh, what we have, we give a small demo, then we can see if it's useful, then uh, it would be uh, awesome if you try it out and uh, scream something about it and maybe uh, ask core people think it uh, should be part of the product or maybe not. But let's have a small uh, look and I hope it will make it easier. So, start the time. I planned on 120 <coughs> seconds to get started with HashCorp Vault. I did cheat because I already did uh, Docker pool, I think, way.io slash Neuralize slash I renamed it today to safe because the safe is smaller and easier to carry to other places, right? So I already pulled it. Is the time ticking? Yeah. <coughs> Shit. Okay, so that's great.
Then uh, we install uh, Neuralize uh, safe. I just pulled the Docker image now. With this command uh, we install it. It's a small uh, bash script and it's uh, 52 lines. How much time do I have left? Uh, One. That's awesome. Okay. So now I have this uh, dummy secrets file and it stores some uh, secret. Can you actually read it? Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. God. Otherwise I was afraid you were ignoring me. <laughs> so, so easier. So we have a secret file here. And we have this installed, uh, we have now installed uh, safe, right? So uh, we've got uh, the secret file to save and we say uh, absorb uh, these secrets. And they wrote it to the vault. And we already installed uh, HashCorp vault, it's only single binary, but I cheated anyway. So uh, you have to install that, it's, uh, you, you download the binary. Who likes uh, compiling? So, uh, and then we do uh, read. For example, uh, secret, example test, MySQL, and we have the secret here. So that's awesome. But the production guys, they are very serious about stuff, and they go for uh, the other uh, approach. So uh, they go uh, Ansible Vault. This is just one utility to decrypt stuff. And then we say we have encrypted file. It's uh, ABC is the password. You can know that. And we have here super secret stuff, so we can do the same thing. We pipe it to uh, save, absorb, and uh, now we say A, B, C, and now it's in there. So now we can say vault, list, and this always confuses me. If I do nothing, it works, no? If I do slash, no value found, secret, we have now example pulled and test stuff. So we're using vault, and you can too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I had uh, recently had a project where I considered using Vault all of three minutes because I had uh, existing configuration files in an existing format and I needed the secrets in there. And is there something to make that easier than bash scripting stuff with set? Sorry, you, you've got existing configuration files? I have configuration files. Let's say I have an existing proprietary configuration file. Yeah. I need my MySQL password in there. Yeah. Before the application starts. Yeah, so you have, uh, for example, uh, Vault is uh, in principle uh, built on console. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any of that. Just no, but now you have Vault, right? So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty cool. But what you do have is uh, a utility called uh, console, uh, what is it? Yeah, console Tempest, thank you. Um, and uh, that I think it, it supports Vault as well, right? Yes. You guys know that. Ah, you do you, your you own work. Uh, you need console stuff. for that, right? I'm not sure because yeah. console yeah. is storing encrypted secrets, and Vault is uh, is the only the guy. The console that template can, uh, you need. Uh, yeah, you don't need console when you use. Oh, no, so it's it's a client to query console, but it's actually also able to query Vault. So, so if you, so I can create my custom config file with some placeholders in there. Yes, and it's a template uh, language, and yeah. you write your uh, you write your uh, config and file. And then feed it to console template with my vault credentials, and I get a working config file back. Yeah, this would be workflow two that I described. Uh, the one where or, or workflow one. Uh, that is a workflow where your uh, apps in production. Mm -hmm. No, that's actually sort of midway because what then happens. What, what then happens is that um, uh, console informs the, the, the server, console server, <coughs> maybe you do need console, but you, because you need a hook to tell the client on your uh, production machine that it needs to update its console file. Console file. So there's a sort of event. Um, and this is sort of middle, middle ground between the workflows I described, because you, you're not storing the secrets with Ansible and writing it to a file, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you're also not querying it act every time you need the secret, querying the vault. But instead, you get an event when your key value store updates. So that's also a very interesting approach. But maybe you do need console event. No, you no? can you can also use confd. Confd by uh, our big friend uh, Hightower. Yeah, you, you don't need console. We can no. talk more after, but console template will uh, respect the lease that vaults in back. So it can update based on the lease value. Oh. That's very it's not like a push. But this it's assumes that you don't change the. It's not like where console template pulls console KV, but when that lease does expire, then console template will regenerate or renew the lease and grab the credentials. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. So there you go. Okay. Thanks.
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe, 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 I don't know. Like, um, um, the look, is there like a lookup plugin for Ansible? A lookup plugin? Yes, yes, actually. There is a lookup plugin. It was very buggy. I submitted a pull request to make it more rigid or solid. Uh, but uh, it's not uh, accepted right. upstream yet. Uh, but actually, there's a reference in the project that I saw on the first page that uh, where you can see the uh, pull request. But there's in, in 2.0, Ansible 2.0, there's look lookup plugin. But I suggest actually you look you use my uh, extension because the existing thing is uh, buggy. The, the, the official one? The is official one is, uh, well, I don't know what is official, but uh, in the in the main uh, thing of uh, Ansible 2.0, mm. yeah. there is a, a lookup uh, plugin, but it's a bit buggy. Okay, right, so we can your repo then. If, if, you, if you like it, if you trust it, uh, you can uh, you can use it. Can I run it in production? Sorry? Can I run it in production? Sure. It's a simple Python script. It's like the, the original thing was... It's uh, a simple Python <laughs> script. <laughs> 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 I mean, I mean the, Ansible, the Ansible Vault uh, uh, query plugin, right? Yeah, it's a 20-line it's a 20, 20 Python script. <coughs> and I added 20 line to do error checking. Sure. That's it. Okay. Right? Okay. And you are allowed to run it in production. It's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you 60 seconds to talk only about Nerd Lives now, and then we'll uh, we'll do a separate talk at another time with Software Circus Meetup about yeah. the cloud recording. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 60 seconds about Nerd Lives. So uh, we are uh, a startup, uh, and we have invested significant efforts and engineering power in the cooling technology. So we're we're pretty awesome now. Uh, and we now have to be at least as awesome in uh, cloud operations and uh, development for that. Um, so uh, we're doing a partnership with Eneco, that was last year. This year we aim for a partnership with an uh, ISP. Uh, and then we'll have, uh, is this being recorded? We will have a significant, uh, in interesting uh, glass fiber stuff. Uh, and um, uh, then you, yeah, the world is your uh, data center. You can build awesome stuff because you have significant uh, uh, significantly interesting uh, infrastructure, uh, but you need uh, interesting engineers. If you now skip OpenStack, this is uh, past technical debt, right? We now make uh, Kubernetes, we make it uh, uh, multi-tenant, and you're gonna schedule uh, secure pods with uh, Hyper, for example, and you schedule them uh, on your uh, infrastructure bare metal, then you not only cut 40% of the, uh, the cost of the operating cloud, but you also cut out all the effort you're doing to maximize your AWS instances because it's just super efficient to first provision virtual machines and then in that do sort of scheduling with where you have no optimization room. Why not use the whole hardware of your cloud infrastructure provider and be optimal? Now, if you think this is awesome, then uh, this is a place for you because we're now starting to uh, get going with this uh, on a really interesting software level. Yeah. I think that's already like two minutes, but I was enjoying it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. One more big round of applause for Eric.